today we will be chatting a little bit about uh, seafood, the Seafood Watch program. A little look behind the curtains, as it were, into some of the inner workings of the program. So for the next 30 minutes, it'll be my pleasure to share with you a little bit of the history of the Seafood Watch program. Um, we'll be talking about the Seafood Watch staff and the teams that we've got on site. We're going to be looking at our standards for wild capture fisheries and aquaculture, the actual criteria that we utilize to do our assessments. I'll talk a little bit about the process and methodology itself and then have time hopefully at the end for questions. As everyone is muted on your audio, you have a, a chat functionality within the WebEx platform. If you wouldn't mind to please type your questions uh, as they come up throughout the presentation, we'll be able to uh, address those questions at the end, but rather than everyone sort of talking over each other, uh, we'll have you type them out individually and be able to filter them better that way. So at a very high level, the Seafood Watch program is a program of the Monterey Bay Aquarium located in Monterey, California. We evaluate the environmental impacts of seafood production, as you may know. And uh, we assess these impacts and develop uh, assessments or reports that speak to the environmental impacts of seafood production. Uh, and we develop these traffic light ratings. Our green is a best choice, yellow good alternative, and our red rated species are seafood that we recommend consumers and businesses avoid purchasing because of some significant environmental impacts with the way they're fished or farmed. We also have this fourth category, eco-certified uh, products, and uh, we'll get back to that in, uh, in just a few moments. A little bit about the history of the program. Some folks may not know the Seafood Watch program uh, celebrated our 20th anniversary last year in 1999. Uh, it got started out of an exhibit from the Monterey Bay Aquarium back in 1997. That exhibit was called Fishing for Solutions. It talked about the different environmental impacts associated with different fishing methods around the world. As part of the Fishing for uh, Solutions exhibit, we developed a tabletop tent card that sat on the tables of our cafeteria at the aquarium. And back in 1997, we noticed as soon as we put those tabletop tent cards out there, people started stealing them. They started taking them home with them. And that was the first indication that there was really a demand for information about uh, environmental impacts uh, of seafood production. And so the uh, Seafood Watch program was launched by the Monterey Bay Aquarium in 1999. And the beginning of the program really focused on building consumer demand. Uh, but with that building of consumer demand, over the years, businesses began to make commitments to be serving only uh, environmentally responsible seafood. As a result of those commitments, producers, fishermen, and farmers were engaging to minimize their environmental impact. Um, and increasingly, Seafood Watch is now engaging with governments across the world, looking to uh, um, uh, sort of engage and gather their support for improvements in some of the regulations around fisheries and aquaculture. So we've been doing this uh, for, for, for quite a long time. So a little bit about how the Seafood Watch program fits in at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Obviously at the top, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, this incredible organization, conservation organization. We've got one uh, department in at the aquarium called Conservation and Science. Uh, within that Conservation and Science department, we've got moving from left to right our animal research programs that focus on sea otters, uh, tunas, specifically uh, Pacific bluefin tuna, and white sharks, great white sharks. We've got an incredibly robust research program at the aquarium uh, tagging and studying great white sharks. Conservation and science also includes our policy department. We engage in, at, uh, with governments at both the local, uh, the state, the national, and increasingly the international level. Uh, so the Seafood Watch program fits in, as I mentioned, to uh, conservation and science. Uh, the Seafood Watch staff and our teams, who we've got working behind the scenes at the aquarium. We obviously have a vice president uh, of Global Ocean Initiatives, and she manages uh, four separate teams. Now the first, and arguably the hub of the Seafood Watch program, the hub of the wheel, is the science team. We've got 11 people on the science team split between fisheries and aquaculture. These folks are developing our reports and uh, uh, the ratings that you see on the Seafood Watch website. Our business team, this is the team that I uh, work on. We've got four people on the business engagement team focusing on sort of the business to business, behind the scenes engagement. Uh, focusing on large food service and hospitality companies, 
and really highlighting culinary engagement, looking to uh, help these businesses understand why it's important for them to engage on sustainable seafood. For all of our consumer-facing, public-facing programs, we've got an outreach team. These are five people who manage that uh, consumer messaging via our website, our mobile app, all of our social media channels, and uh, those communications platforms. We also have a very robust program that reaches out to other aquariums, zoos, and conservation organizations across the country and increasingly around the world. And that conservation outreach partner program is also included uh, under the outreach umbrella. And finally, our monitoring and evaluation team. We've got three people on this team who are involved uh, with tracking the impact of the Seafood Watch program and really allowing the senior leadership to be able to make data-driven decisions. Uh, everything that we do is based on the science. Um, so even our own work, we want to have data uh, on the impacts of that work. And that's what M&E does. So a few comments on the standards themselves, the wild capture fishery standards that we look at to uh, make our assessments. You see here the four criteria that evaluate the environmental impacts of wild capture fisheries. Criterion one is the impact on the stock. This is the target population. Of the fish that are being targeted by the fishery, uh, how many of the fish are out there? Are there a lot? Are there a little? Uh, pop population status reports uh, speak to uh, some of the health of that target population. Criterion two are the impact on other species, impacts on non-target animals. What other animals are accidentally caught by the fishing gear besides the target population? This might be things like whales, turtles, sharks, seabirds, things like this. This is what's known as bycatch. Um, so bycatch impacts captured in Criterion 2. Criterion 3 is our management effectiveness. What regulations are in place to management the fishery? And what enforcement uh, is in place to make sure that the management is actually occurring? And finally, habitat and ecosystem impacts. We're looking at interactions, physical interactions between the fishing gear and the ecosystem itself. So are you dragging a very heavy net along a sensitive sea floor, for example, things like this. Our aquaculture standards are a little bit different. You can appreciate that the environmental impacts associated with wild capture fisheries and with fish farming uh, are different. And so uh, as a result, our standards and criteria that we use to assess uh, aquaculture standards different than what we use for wild capture fisheries. Our first criterion is data. We're looking at data availability and the robustness of those data. Uh, obviously, looking at all of these uh, next criteria, we need to have data that speak to the effluent, the habitat, the chemical use. So what data are out there and how uh, robust are those data? Uh, when we say data, we're talking about primary literature, scientific reports, uh, government reports, white papers, uh, interviews with the industry, interviews with academics, uh, any bit of expert uh, input that we can gather, uh, we uh, include in the data criterion. Criterion two is effluent, looking at nutrient effluent, specifically feed and feces, uh, as they're having nutrient impacts downstream from the farm. So how, how are the wastes discharged from the farm and how are those wastes impacting downstream environments? Criterion three is our habitat criterion. How has this uh, physical footprint of the farm changed as a result of building and operating that farm? Did they have to cut down trees to build ponds, for example, things like this? Criterion four is our chemical use. We're looking at what chemicals are used on the farm and in what frequency, and what some of the environmental impacts of that usage might be. Criterion five is our feed criterion. We're looking at what uh, goes into any feed that is applied. What are the sources of those feed ingredients? What are the relative sustainability of those feed ingredients? Is there a net protein gain or loss as a result of farming operations? All of these uh, options uh, are captured in the feed criterion. Criterion six is escapes. What is the risk of escapes from uh, farms into wild populations? Uh, criterion seven looks at that same risk, but risk of disease transfer from farms into wild populations. What's the risk of disease transmission? Criteria eight, nine, and 10, you'll see an X next to. These are exceptional criteria that don't necessarily apply in every aquaculture operation that we assess, but if they are occurring, they can be very significant. So these are scored on sort of a negative scale. If they're not occurring, the score is zero. If they are occurring, a negative number is applied to penalize the assessment as a result. 
so to give you an example, Criterion 8X is our source of stock. This is looking at where juveniles uh, are sourced from. Are they getting the juveniles from hatcheries, or do they still have a reliance on wild populations to produce juveniles? Most aquaculture operations, you're going to find the babies produced in hatcheries. They've closed the life cycle of those animals. Uh, but for some examples, tuna and eels uh, are a few. They haven't yet been able to close the life cycle. They're still, they are still sourcing juveniles from wild populations. And so as a result, uh, this criterion uh, source of stock, 8X, uh, would uh, have a penalty as a result. We want to see reliance on hatcheries, not reliance on wild populations. Criterion 9X, wildlife mortalities, are uh, any other animals impacted as a result of farm operations. Uh, there are things like predator deterrence. Uh, there's things like unintentional interactions uh, between wildlife and fish farms. And these are captured in the wildlife mortalities criterion 9X. In 10X, the last criterion is introduction. If you're moving animals from one body of water to another in aquaculture operations, which happens very regularly, what are the risk of introductions of an unintended organism to be brought in the water from one place to another? All of these uh, criteria are captured in our aquaculture standards and assessed uh, in an aquaculture report. So the output of that assessment looks something like this. This is a final aquaculture recommendation where you see each of the criteria listed out on the left-hand side. Each criterion is scored individually and assigned its own color rating. Uh, they're all then combined at the end of an assessment into the final overall ranking that you see on the bottom below. So we've got a couple of scoring rules. Uh, if there's one red criterion, for example, the final rank cannot be green. Uh, if there's two red criterion, uh, the final ranking has to be red. Uh, so there, if, if any individual criteria are, uh, are having significant environmental impacts, that could force the entire assessment one direction. A few comments about the assessment process, how we actually develop these, uh, these reports and utilize these standards to, to develop them. The first step is to confirm the scope and uh, draft, uh, first draft of the report. So the scope of a report is a specific species caught or farmed in a specific location with a specific gear type or production method. Um, so uh, farmed salmon in net pens in British Columbia would be the scope of an assessment. Um, once we have that scope, we begin gathering data, putting them uh, into the criteria, and developing the, the first draft of the report. As I mentioned, some different sources of information that we look to gather, uh, we're looking at scientific journals, government reports, uh, interviews with industry, as well as academic scientists. Once we have a first draft of the report, we go through an internal review process where our science team uh, takes a look at the report, makes sure that it's uh, appropriately referenced, and that you've got uh, effective interpretation of the standards and criteria themselves, making sure that it's consistent with our existing body of work. From here, we go to external peer review. We send that draft report out uh, for between three and 20 experts, depending on the complexity of the report. Uh, we're always looking for folks who are experts and who can weigh in on the validity of the reports themselves. And we are very, very appreciative of our peer review community. Once we gather the peer review, we've got a second internal review where we incorporate the peer review feedback as appropriate. Now, this develops essentially a final draft that then goes to a finalization presentation, essentially an oral defense by the author, uh, presenting to a few of the other conservation organizations that Seafood Watch works with uh, to get that final approval and uh, check off. This entire process takes anywhere from six to 24 months in some very extreme cases. We do update our assessments as needed when new information becomes available that would materially change the outcome of a report. Uh, or we look to update these reports once every four years, the normal life cycle of a Seafood Watch assessment. So how can you find Seafood Watch information? How can you find uh, our uh, resources? Obviously, the mobile app. It's free to download anywhere you get your mobile apps for both Android and Apple. Uh, it updates automatically anytime new or updated ratings are published. Uh, and it puts the entire power of the program right in the palm of your hand. If you haven't yet downloaded the Seafood Watch app, highly encourage you to do so uh, at the end of this webinar. And obviously, the website, C 
seafoodwatch.org is our website where you've got uh, all of the information uh, about our ratings, some of the different businesses and organizations that we work with, resources for consumers, uh, information and uh, educational resources, a whole host of uh, materials that are available there on the website. Um, so with that, I will make an encouragement and an endorsement to sign up to receive our free resources if you haven't already yet done so. Uh, to do that would be on the Seafood Watch website under the Businesses and Organizations tab along the top. Uh, you see here a screenshot of our Seafood Sustainability Guide for Businesses. Uh, this is uh, one of the cornerstones of a new suite of materials that we've just developed. Uh, so we encourage you to explore on the Seafood Watch uh, website. Check out what resources we have available. We've got something for everybody. So with that, I'll thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time and your attention today. I think we've got uh, a few minutes where we can uh, review the chat functionality, see if there are any questions uh, that have been sent through. Um, and definitely want to, uh, again, thank you for your time and hope everyone is safe and well out there. Uh, I've got a question here. What impacts do you think the coronavirus outbreak will cause to the wild fisheries industry? That's a very good question and one that I'm certainly unprepared to answer uh, in depth, but I would, I would say that uh, across the board, we expect um, that, that everything is going to be impacted in ways that are still uncertain and to be determined. Um, we are seeing uh, very, very big impacts as a result of the coronavirus pandemic uh, happening uh, among restaurants that are serving seafood. These are some of the uh, businesses, business audiences that we engage with most readily. Um, and so uh, we are definitely sensitive to that. Uh, encouraging everyone, if it's safe to do so, uh, to please uh, support your local restaurants that serve seafood. Uh, take take uh, some, some pickups, some to-go orders. Um, show them some love because they're definitely uh, hurting at the moment. I've got a question here. Would aquaculture standards change for a land-based operation? That's a very good question. We actually recently just published an updated recirculating aquaculture systems report. And this report looked at land-based systems uh, using the same 10 uh, aquaculture uh, criteria that we saw just a moment ago, uh, just looking at the environmental impacts associated with uh, land-based recirculating production. Uh, so the standards themselves, no, they don't change uh, when you're looking at different uh, uh, production systems. They're going to be applied universally across the board, whether you're looking at a land-based system for aquaculture, a net pen, pond-based system, um, and it's the same on wild capture fisheries. If you're looking at a long line fishery versus a hook and line fishery versus a purse thing, uh, those uh, wild capture fisheries are going to be applied universally uh, the same way across the board. So there's some questions here about uh, the reports themselves. All of the reports themselves are available on the Seafood Watch website. So seafoodwatch.org, if you go to uh, the website, uh, you can do a search for the individual seafood that you're interested in. Uh, there was a question here specifically about that recirculating aquaculture systems report, uh, because so many different species can be grown in recirculating systems. Uh, if you search for basically any species that's farmed, uh, we're going to have a research assessment and you can access the report that way. Uh, I've got a question about the uh, PowerPoint and uh, a recording of this webinar. We are going to make a recording of the webinar available on the Seafood Watch website. It does take a little bit of time to upload and host onto that site, uh, but we'll be sure to send out a link to all of the folks uh, maybe through our communications channels, we can start to build out uh, a bit of a library of some of these recordings. Um, and if you're interested in these slides uh, themselves, please uh, reach out to, to Seafood Watch directly. Uh, my email address is b a l b a u m b album at m b a y a q dot org. Uh, but if you reach out to any general Seafood Watch inquiry. Uh, address and uh, say, hey, you know, it was on the webinar with Brian, would like a copy of that uh, slide deck that he shared, we'd be more than happy to share this with you all. A question here uh, some, asking about some of the information that we gather for our assessments. 
uh, specifically direct interviews uh, with fishery stakeholders? Uh, yes, the answer uh, to that question is yes. We always uh, look to make contact with the industry that we are assessing, whether it be a, a fishery or an aquaculture operation. Uh, we always uh, invite them to provide data, to provide input, uh, to be interviewed, uh, oftentimes to act as peer reviewers. Uh, whether or not those industries engage with us is a question that remains to be seen. Uh, some folks uh, have uh, feelings about Seafood Watch that are more on the negative side and think that any sort of engagement with our program uh, would be seen as sort of a bad thing. Uh, we're still looking to change that narrative, but it does still exist out there. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, increased data increases the transparency, which always uh, increases the accuracy of the assessments in which we conduct. So we want to be sure that our assessments are accurate, uh, that they are capturing the environmental impacts as they're occurring today. And so input from the fishery directly is uh, absolutely vital to making sure that uh, we, we achieve that objective. There's a great question here about other factors outside of the environmental impacts of seafood, specifically some of the social aspects around seafood production. That's a very good question. Uh, because we're a program of the Monterey Bay Aquarium, whose mission is to inspire conservation of the ocean, Seafood Watch has a, uh, an environmental lens through which we do our work. Now, having said that, over the last couple of years, it has become abundantly clear that there are some very egregious human rights abuses that are occurring within uh, seafood supply chains around the world. Um, and so to combat those abuses, to, to try to pull back uh, the wool and uh, increase some visibility into that space, uh, Seafood Watch, in conjunction with a few other organizations, developed the Seafood Slavery Risk Tool, SSRT. It's a new tool um, that uh, you can find uh, if you do a Google search, uh, Seafood Slavery Risk Tool, you pull up the website. Um, and it's uh, the beginnings of a database that pulls together information about uh, different social and human rights abuses as they occur in seafood supply chains. Um, really designed to give uh, buyers of seafood an additional layer of visibility into some specific products. So still very early days. Um, that database has yet to be fleshed out uh, with uh, more profiles uh, for, for more seafood in countries. But overall, um, we're hoping that that will be a, a tool that folks will engage with to help combat some of these human rights abuses that we're seeing in, uh, in seafood. But uh, to answer the question, uh, social rights abuses would not be included in a, a Seafood Watch assessment. It would have to be an additional layer uh, using those additional tools that we've developed. There's a question here about uh, Fish Choice. It's another uh, conservation organization that Seafood Watch works with. Fish Choice is an online database of seafood suppliers who have made a commitment to being transparent with their offerings. They're going to tell you what species, where it's from, how it's caught, uh, and therefore the Seafood Watch rating that's associated with the products that they sell. So anytime you're interested in sourcing seafood uh, that you want to have confidence in the Seafood Watch rating and the sourcing details of where it's from, uh, fishchoice.com. It's a resource where we direct folks to. Uh, they've got that searchable supplier database. Um, it's, a, it's a great resource, along with a lot of other tools and uh, educational materials uh, to share with some of your teams. A um, question here about the engagement with producers. Yeah, so uh, producers, uh, fishermen and farmers themselves are definitely engaging with uh, the Seafood Watch program uh, during the process of the development of the report. Um, so uh, oftentimes they're providing data, uh, they're providing uh, input, uh, they're providing feedback during the peer review process. Um, obviously producers have a vested interest in having a positive outcome for that report. Uh, we always fall back on the science. We fall back on the standards and the consistency with which those standards are applied. Um, so we don't uh, make sort of judgment calls one way or the other. Sometimes people think that we're sitting back here in our offices in Monterey with a dart board, just throwing darts and deciding what the, what the rating is going to be. Uh, but uh, that's, the, that's not the case. Uh, there's a full sort of robust process and methodology that's behind everything to make sure that the outcome is going to be consistent uh, with our existing body of work and uh, is not going to be 
um, impacted one way or the other by any sort of advocacy or lobbying from, uh, from any given folks. I've got a question here about engaging with the supply chain and the importance of communicating to your supplier if you buy seafood, uh, how important it is that you know some of those sourcing details, what it is, where it's from, how it's caught or farmed. Um, without some of these basic details, it may be impossible to determine the Seafood Watch rating of the product itself. Um, and so uh, really open up a conversation with your supplier, your vendor, let them know that this is important to you uh, to be transparent with the sourcing details that you're interested in minimizing the, the purchases of red-rated seafoods, for example, if that's a, an outcome of your, of your business. Um, and uh, uh, really look into make sure that uh, everyone is engaged and aware of uh, the outcome that you're looking for. So another question about my uh, email address, and I'm having trouble Difficult. Oh, no, there it goes. I'm able to share that with you all. I think that is my email address there. A uh, question here about different languages that we have these materials available in. Uh, the app is only available in English, but the standards themselves, the criteria, are available in a few different languages. Spanish, I think, um, a few. Uh, Southeast Asian dialects, I believe, but check the Seafood Watch website uh, to, to, to make sure. Uh, and a few questions here about eco-certification. So maybe I'll, I'll end on that note. Uh, eco-certifications are uh, one tool in the toolbox when it comes to identifying uh, environmentally responsible seafood. And Seafood Watch defers to a number of eco-certifications, specifically the Marine Stewardship Council, uh, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, and then a couple of uh, other ones for uh, species-specific standards that they, they, they have assessed. If they uh, certify this species, we'll defer to that species, um, but, but, but not this other one over here. So for more information on eco-certification, please visit the Seafood Watch website, seafoodwatch.org. We've got a tab along the top uh, that says eco-certification and you can learn all the uh, specific criteria, uh, standards that we defer to, um, as well as some of the work, ongoing work that we're doing uh, with the eco-certification standard holders, helping them strengthen the standards, ultimately looking to mitigate those environmental impacts. So folks, we have reached the end of our time together today. I really appreciate uh, the engagement and everybody logging on and joining us. Uh, as I mentioned, this webinar was recorded and will be available on the Seafood Watch website uh, probably within the next week, and we will send out a link to this recording uh, so that you all can access it at your leisure, share it with those folks in your circles who may have missed uh, the webinar today. Uh, from all of us at Seafood Watch, wishing you all a very safe and uh, well week, and looking forward to connecting soon. Thanks all. Bye for now.